Thank you, Shara, for that introduction. Thank you all for coming. I know it's a small room, but uh, thanks for hanging in there and packing in. I won't uh, take up too much time here. I was told to keep this uh, relatively short, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best here. Um, so let's just jump right into things. So this is a talk about how airplanes fly, which is a very common question that aerospace engineers get. And I actually thought back to my undergrad days, and after I finished undergrad, I couldn't really answer that. Um, I was lost in the details. I took aerodynamics, like you guys took aerodynamics, and you know, I think about what I teach you guys even, and I realized that I spend very little time talking about how airplanes actually fly and kind of focusing on um, the fundamental concepts um, because there's a lot of material to cover. And so, speaking of material to cover, um, we actually do know how airplanes fly. I mean, we design airplanes. Um, uh, even though we get comments uh, like this from the media, um, to those who fear flying, it's probably disconcerting that physicists and aeronautical engineers still debate the fundamental issue of what keeps planes in the air. Um, and so that is kind of a too dire of a state, I would say. Um, we do know how uh, heavier than air vehicles can fly. We do, can design these things. We have been designing these things for over 100 years. Um, and we can't just do this by trial and error. Um, we have models. That's how airplanes fly, right? Um, we have these things called the Navier-Stokes equations. This is how we describe fluid motion. I was told not to put equations up, but I couldn't resist. Um, <laughs> so uh, these, these equations derive from physical laws. Um, you can kind of go back to the uh, assumptions of what makes air air and kind of get to these equations. Um, and they do tell us everything that we need to know in order to predict how an aircraft's going to produce lift. Um, and they are used a lot by people that do, C that do CFD and um, even kind of experiments. Uh, you, you kind of can go back to these equations to get physical insight. Well, what's the problem? Um, if you're not an engineer, you don't appreciate the beauty of these equations. Um, even engineers uh, don't get much intuition out of these equations. And so uh, you need something simpler. So I give this example here. Well, if you want to explain how a magnet works, you probably don't go to Maxwell's equation, especially if you're trying to find an intuitive uh, explanation. But why do people care so much about aircraft? Um, lift is not just unique to aircraft. We have sailboats. You have racing cars. Um, you have marine applications. But you know these things don't fly, right? Um, and flying is somehow somehow um, ingrained into our minds as something that's really kind of magic, um, something that's not intuitive. If you're heavier than air, how can you actually rise into the air? Um, how can 10 tons of thrust keep a 150-ton aircraft in the air? Um, I was actually at a meeting. Uh, it was like some um, college-wide, actually, it was a university-wide meeting a couple years ago. Um, I think I had to do was graduation exercises, and there were people from all different departments. And um, I mean, I was talking to professors in other departments, non-engineering, and everybody thought that, well, not, at least at my table, that um, the amount of thrust that you need was equal to the weight of the aircraft. And that is a co very common misconception, I realized. Um, yeah, if you want to fly like a fighter jet, you can go straight up, you do need all the thrust. But typically, you can do with much less thrust than the actual weight of the aircraft, which is kind of amazing. Um, and so people do ask, how is this possible? Um, and so we want an intuitive explanation. That's something that we can relate to. Um, and that's not wrong, I say here. Uh, you know, how do you explain this to non-engineers? How do you explain it to kids? Um, and you can't just revert to Navier-Stokes equations. Um, and so you got to do something more intuitive. And you know, a good one that I kind of like to use is about how rockets work. Um, most people can somewhat relate to this, uh, even kids. Um, and you know, you'd say something like, OK, a chemical rocket works because it pushes hot gas out of the nozzle really fast. And OK, now we go to Newton's third law, but people usually have some kind of intuition that if you push against something, you get pushed back. And so the action reaction you know, is somewhat intuitive. And so uh, that pushes the rocket the other way. And so that's reasonably intuitive. Can we get? some kind of intuition like this for lift generation. Um, so that's the challenge. That's a quick goal for the talk. Uh, we want an explanation that doesn't require an aerospace engineering degree to understand. It goes far enough to leave us satisfied, and it's not wrong. 
Um, so first, let's look at some explanations that do try to achieve some of these, but I'll show missed the last one not being wrong. And so we'll look at two dimensions, uh, which means that we're looking at a wing cross-section. OK, so I call this section fallacies. So what's wrong with something like this? Um, this is a picture that I kind of uh, first saw when I was looking into um, airfoil and lift gener airfoils and lift generation. And in fact, this explanation is the one that I gave in my 10th grade science project. Um, <laughs> equal transit time theory. Uh, air moves faster over top surface because it has a larger distance to cover compared to air moving under the airfoil. So if you've got fluid elements that are buddies in the front, they end up buddies in the back. And so the one that went over the top had to go faster. That's the, somehow the explanation for uh, why you get uh, velocity difference. OK, now, if you can explain the velocity difference, there's this cool equation called Bernoulli's equation that tells you that faster air moves, uh, well, okay, faster air has lower pressure. And so if you've got lower pressure over the top than over the bottom, then you get this net lift generation because now you have a pressure imbalance. And so this is cool. We have an equation. It seems like you know, we're actually going and uh, we know what we're talking about. But of course, the starting point had to be correct. And it turns out the starting point is not correct. And the starting point was the velocity difference explanation. So I call this fail here. Why? Because. Um, well, first of all, it can't explain a lot of things. It can't explain how an aircraft, aircraft wing can fly um, upside down, how to generate positive lift, or how a flat plate like a sheet of paper or balsa wing glider, balsa wing glider can generate lift. Um, and so, and also, it's wrong in that if, even if you account for like a typical airfoil, the velocity uh, uh, difference that you would get it's too small of a velocity difference to generate the pressure differences that you observe in real aircraft. So, and the fluid elements do not meet up at the trailing edge. And if you do experiments, you'll see that that's not the case. So um, there's nothing wrong here with Bernoulli's equation, um, like I say here. But there's no reason um, to apply it if you can't get past the starting point. Um, what about another explanation, particle kinetic theory, that molecules just bounce off the airfoil and get the re deflected downwards and you acquire negative vertical momentum and now you feel a force upward. Okay, this is getting more intuitive, um, kind of like the rocket explanation. You kind of start deflecting air molecules down and you get lift. The problem is that um, the molecules explanation here will be that molecules that don't see the airfoil do not get affected. They just pass right, uh, right through. And if you do kind of the math here, you find that you get a lift that is proportional to the angle of attack squared. OK, the sine of the angle of attack squared. Um, one of them accounts for the fact that there's a projected area of this airfoil. And the other sign accounts for how much is being deflected, um, which is not what we observe in practice. We observe a linear relationship between the lift and the angle of attack. And so what's missing here is the fact that the air molecules aren't just independent things. They're interacting with other air molecules. And that whole continuum is something we have to take into account. There's also appeals to Venturi theory. Um, so the Venturi effect is something where if you constrict the air, then it moves faster. Um, and so the idea is that if you have an upper uh, surface that's curved, you get a constriction. And that causes lower pressures by Bernoulli's equation. And you get lift. Well, here's a problem. Um, the Venturi effect idea applied to a flat plate um, would mean that you would not actually get lift this way at positive angles of attack, because you would have an expansion, more area here, less area here, and you would actually get the opposite effect of what you're, what you're expecting. Um, and so the problem is that external flows do not behave like nozzles. There are no walls on the top and bottom um, surfaces. Um, and in fact, the disturbances propagate really far away from the airfoil. Um, another uh, misconception that even people that graduate as aerospace engineers have is that the flow remains unaffected until it hits the airfoil. In fact, the disturbance gets felt upstream even. So this whole picture is wrong for many reasons. Um, the disturbance is felt everywhere around the airfoil. Okay, so now some good explanations. Um, lift 
is the reaction force experienced by the airfoil due to its turning of the flow downwards. So if you have a two-sentence opportunity to explain lift, this is something I would go for. Um, you know, if you just have a, you know, 30 seconds, let's say, um, you would say, or I would say, uh, you get lift because the wing pushes the airflow downwards. Now, it's not exactly the same as the deflection of the molecules. I'm not talking about molecules. I'm talking about redirecting the flow. That flow is coming in over the wing, and the wing, somehow through its surfaces, causes a turn in the flow downward. That turning creates a downward momentum in the flow, which causes a um, vertical force, lift force upwards due to momentum balance. And that's a lift force. And if you wanted to get into more details, then you could appeal to something called streamlined curvature, which is actually not that difficult of a concept to explain. I think this is easier to explain than Bernoulli's equation. Bernoulli's equation, you know, you have to go to the inverse relationship between pressure and velocity, and you really have to appeal to an equation um, to kind of tell you that. There's not that, I mean, there's some intuition, but it's not, um, it's not immediately obvious why pressure and velocity are inversely related. This, I think, is a little more intuitive, um, and that is that if fluid curves, there must be a pressure difference. And the concept here is that pressure differences cause forces on fluid elements or pieces of the fluid. And so if a streamline is doing something like this, curving downward, it must feel a force pressing downward on it. It's turning away from the high pressure region. And so the pressure on the top being higher than the pressure on the bottom is what causes the force that causes the turning. So whenever you see uh, streamlines curving, whenever you see the fluid element change direction, that means that it's in a region where there's high pressure on one side, pushing it to low pressure on the other side. And so that's how you can explain the pressure, um, pressure difference. And you could actually get mathematical about this and get another equation. Um, you could get, let's say, semi-quantitative um, if you wanted to. So you find that the tighter of a turn you get, the more of a pressure difference you get. But the main idea is if you turn, uh, then you, you establish a pressure gradient, or basically a pressure gradient is what causes the fluid to turn. So now, using streamlined curvature, you can explain the pressure difference on an airfoil. Because if you see streamlines that are curving downward, so this is the starting point that you draw the streamlines first, and then you explain the pressure difference. So if you draw the streamlines as curving downward, because that's what the airfoil did to the, street, the flow, then the high pressure below the airfoil is explained by the fact that these streamlines are curved, which means that there's higher pressure compared to the free stream pressure, which I call P infinity. And so you get a pressure gradient that causes higher pressure here. Compared to over the top, it's the same direction pressure gradient, but now you have to end up at P infinity, so you start with lower pressure here. And so that's kind of the explanation of the pressure differences that you could then use to get the lift as a um, as a product, as a result of a pressure difference. But I have to mention again that you don't need to do this. This is only if you wanted to explain the pressure difference. You don't need to go into pressure in order to explain lift. You could just say you're turning the flow downward and then appeal to conservation of momentum. If the flow turns down, you get a force upward. So this is only kind of an after the fact using the shape of the streamlines to explain pressure. Okay, at this point, are you satisfied? These are relatively simple explanations. The concepts, I would say, are pretty easy to relate to, especially if you have some engineering background. Um, they are correct as far as they go, um, but do they leave you satisfied? Well, depends. Depends on how much you want to know. Uh, usually most non-engineers will be satisfied by this explanation. Um, something like, you know, if you stick your hand out a car window and you turn your and downward slightly, you feel your hand go up. You know, okay, yeah, you feel the idea of deflecting flow downwards, causing uh, your hand to go up. You know, that's kind of what a wing is doing. Um, but there are some follow-up questions, um, and curious people usually ask these. Why, um, you know, how does the airflow make the streamlines look the way they do? Um, why does the flow actually turn down instead of just going straight uh, for most of the airfoil, throughout uh, most of the region around the airfoil?
Okay, so the details. Um, last section here. Um, how does the airfoil turn to flow? On the bottom surface, it's easy to accept, I would say, because there's nowhere else that the flow can go. If the flow comes in horizontally, hits the bottom surface, this is again like the deflection ar uh, argument, it's going to be going downwards when it leaves the, uh, leaves the airfoil. That, that could turn downward. Um, what about the top surface? That's not so easy to accept. Why does the flow do this instead of going straight? Well, in fact, it can go straight. Um, it doesn't have to stay attached to the airfoil. We call this concept separation. So there's a counterexample where, yeah, the airflow on the bottom did go down, but the airflow over the top said, no, I'm going to go straight. And now you get all these kind of all this mess behind it, usually unsteady flow behind uh, the point of separation. So I would say here counterexamples exist, as do amazing counter counterexamples. This is a case where you have flow over a really curved airfoil, and actually it's a multiple element airfoil. So if you're coming in for landing, this is typically what aircraft use. And you have here a CFD simulation, but it's showing you kind of flow over this airfoil and staying mostly attached. So this is the flow. It's kind of, these are the same kind of uh, fluid elements uh, at different times. And what happens is that, yeah, you get some separation down here, but for most of the airflow, you can stay attached. And we can design these things to stay attached. In fact, this is the kind of uh, um, the key design uh, point for high lift airfoils. If you want to generate a lot of lift, you want to turn both the flow below the airfoil down and the flow above the airfoil down um, without this kind of region of separation. Otherwise, you lose lift, and you also end up making a lot of drag. So, how does the air follow the curved top surface? Um, so, there are some non-convincing, I would say, explanations that you don't like voids. Um, the airfoil doesn't like voids, so that's why it hugs the airfoil. Um, so, uh, yes, a vacuum. If you had a vacuum in here, you can't have nothing. If you had a vacuum, that would pull the streamline down. Um, but you don't need a vacuum there. You could have a recirculation region, we call it. You could have flow that's there doing circles, and um, everything would be OK. Like, this is a perfectly acceptable solution. So, that, so air doesn't like, you know, the fact that air does not like voids is not a convincing explanation. There's another non-convincing explanation that the air sticks to the top surface because of viscosity. And somehow viscous forces, which is, you think of viscosity as stickiness of a fluid, um, like honey, for example, that that's what actually makes the fluid adhere to the top surface. But air is not sticky. Uh, and we know that air has very little viscosity. We assume often that it's inviscid, meaning that it has no viscosity, and then we just make corrections for viscosity later. Okay, those of you who are taking 325 now, that we're actually talking about boundary layers, so ignore that. Um, <laughs> that's very important. You can't just say ignore you know, no viscosity. But, um, Here's another non-convincing explanation. Uh, this is uh, sometimes um, kind of a demonstration. You can do this demonstration. If you take a piece of paper and you blow air over it, you see, there, um, you see kind of the, the fact that the piece of paper rises. And what happens there is that a jet uh, sticks to a surface, the uh, uh, Kawanda effect. Um, and this is a real effect. Um, it's caused by, as you say here, entrainment of flow uh, around the jet, that when a jet comes out um, of whatever's creating the jet, some of the still air around it gets entrained with that jet due to viscous effect, so it gets pulled along. And that actually, that entrained air carries with it some slightly lower pressure that then causes the adhering of the flow to, of the jet to the surface. And this is actually um, an effect that um, that is, is real, and you can explain it uh, by this entrainment um, kind of uh, explanation. And it holds for jets that are blowing air into uh, kind of still atmospheres. Um, there's no jet when you talk about an airfoil that's flying through the still atmosphere. And so its application to what happens, to explaining what happens on top surface is not quite direct. Also, if you just give it effect a name, without actually citing why, you know, why it happens doesn't explain it. 
So really, really we want some more intuition. OK, so um, I do go out, I do like this explanation, um, just, but it does require a little bit of uh, kind of uh, um, understanding beforehand about you know, what the fluid elements do. And so bear with me for one slide here. Let's just make an assumption that we have inviscid flow. Inviscid flow means there's no viscosity. And um, the only way that you could get forces on the fluid is through pressure. And pressure is something that is what we call isotropic. It only acts normal to the fluid element. So it cannot cause fluid elements to rotate. It acts the same in all directions. So we cannot get rotation. OK, so now that we have assumed this, in viscid flow, we know that fluid elements can't rotate. What if the flow did not follow the curvature of the top surface and did something like that? OK, we know we can't have a vacuum because the streamlines will get sucked in. We know that we can't have stagnant air here because Bernoulli tells us that the pressures will be different. Not moving, moving. The pressures will be different, and there will be a mismatch, and that will cause the streamlines to start curving. Can you have a recirculation? In this case, you can't if you have inviscid flow. Why? Because the elements inside would be rotating. And you know that you can't have rotating fluid elements if all you have is pressure forces. So for inviscid flow, you cannot have this. You can't have this solution. What about some unbounded recirculation, where there's no actual kind of loop, but the fluid kind of does that and comes back? No, because here you'd have a shear layer, and shear layers actually have rotation in them. And so none of those are possible solutions. And so for flow that's inviscid, the flow has to split when it hits the body, has to come together when it exits the body, when it uh, kind of uh, meets it, goes at a trailing edge. It has to look something like this. Well, or that. Um, <laughs> so once we throw away viscosity, we actually open up a small can of worms here um, in that we can get flows that look like this. And it turns out that there's actually an infinite number of solutions. And so I'm not going to go through the details of this, but you could do potential flow. I'm not going to go through that. <laughs> um, but if you took this math to a mathematician, this mathematics that governs inviscid flow, the mathematician would tell you you have an infinite number of solutions. And it's not just the fact that if you're doing potential flow, you can only define things up to a constant. There's actually an infinite number of flow fields you can get if you throw away viscosity. And so it's not a good idea to just throw away viscosity. You need to keep viscosity there, at least in the back of your mind, the fact that the flow is viscous, because viscosity will pick out the right solution. How? Through this thing called the Cutter condition. Cutter condition, which you guys that have taken aerodynamics, you've seen, is actually a relatively intuitive condition. This condition just tells you that the flow must leave a trailing edge smoothly if it's going to be physical. Um, this red streamline here is not physical because it wraps around the trailing edge. And it just seems wrong for a flow to do that. A flow cannot make sharp turns like this. It cannot make sharp turns like this because actually of boundary layers and separation. The flow will separate at a sharp trailing edge. You would need uh, very sharp pressure gradients to make a turn like this. So this is going to be the physical solution. And only one f of those flow fields that I showed here has that. Okay, it's probably this one in the middle that the flow leaves the trailing edge smoothly. So viscosity lets you pick off the right solution from an infinite number of inviscid solutions. But the point is that all inviscid solutions follow the body uh, and may come together at once what we call a stagnation point, and then leave the body at another stagnation point. They all kind of hug the surface of the airfoil. And now the right one is the one that actually satisfies this trailing edge condition. OK, what's so special about the trailing edge? Why does the flow have to separate the trailing edge? It doesn't have to. Like I said before, you have this picture here, where the flow decides not, it doesn't want, to go, doesn't want to follow the curvature all the way over here. And so it does have, uh, you have potential problems at other points too. But the trailing edge is the most difficult turn. And so the cutter condition is a pretty, pretty strong condition that you can't, can't make that turn at that point. It's too sharp of a trailing edge. And then, of course, um, if you bring back viscosity everywhere, you, know, you might say, I'm cheating. I'm using viscosity only at the trailing edge. And everywhere else, I'm assuming viscid flow. 
Well, it turns out the problem's not that bad um, if you bring back viscosity everywhere. Um, again, those of you taking aerodynamics right now, we're talking about boundary layers, and the boundary layers are really thin. So if you bring back viscosity everywhere, then you can still kind of assume that everything is roughly inviscid and would adhere to the model we described, but there'd be a thin region where the flow is viscous. And that viscous flow is what's actually setting the cut of condition at trailing edge. And if you really start ramping up the angle of attack, that's what's going to cause separation because now the viscous region is going to be much bigger. But for most purposes, when you have an on-design airfoil, low angles of attack, it's not going to be a problem. I do want to show you something um, which is a numerical solution of flow over an airfoil just to show you what pressure does. I think it's kind of useful to actually see what the pressure is doing for flow over an airfoil. Uh, we often think airfoil, low pressure on top, high pressure on the bottom, we get lift. In fact, the pressure distribution is a little more complicated. Here are some contours of pressure shown in atmospheres. Red is high pressure, blue is low pressure. And you see that the region of low pressure is really concentrated here in this leading edge where the flow makes a sharp turn around this, uh, around this airfoil. And at, for most of the rest of the airfoil, the pressure actually increases until it gets to trailing edge where there's another region of high pressure. And then here, the highest pressure is again towards the leading edge. And then you get kind of a slow decrease in the pressure. To, and then eventually it increases again right at the trailing edge. And so this picture kind of partially explains why you get more lift towards the front of the airfoil than towards the back. Um, the center of pressure is usually somewhere near the quarter cord location. And it's partly because of this. Um, but you also see that um, the air goes from high pressure to low pressure here. And that's great. It's getting pushed by this pressure gradient from high pressure regions to low pressure regions. So it can make a tight turn, no problem. It can negotiate that turn, most airfoils, without any issues because it's got this force pushing it behind, uh, from behind. So it's not going to be separating. Um, but then it runs to this adverse pressure gradient. That's where you can get issues. And so if you've taken aerodynamics already, then you know this, this adverse pressure gradient is what's responsible for separation. That's where the fluid element can come off the airfoil. Um, and so uh, that's an explanation for, explanation for separation. Um, and uh, most of the time, separation will occur somewhere on the back. It's very rare to have separation at the front unless you have a really badly designed airfoil. All right, so that's pretty much the summary. Um, uh, if you want a really detailed explanation, so you know we started with the, uh, the fallacies, we went through the um, good explanations, which is flow turning, and then streamline curvature to explain the pressure difference. If you want the, all the details and you want to explain why flow goes over the top surface, curves downward, then I would say that the most, most rigorous, without getting into too many equations explanation, is this idea of using inviscid flow theory when that tells you that, yeah, the flow can't do anything else but go around this object, and then bringing back viscosity, which is separation, right at the trailing edge, picks out the one solution from an infinite number of possibilities. And uh, yeah, so if you asked why do aircraft generate lift or how do they generate lift, my recommendation is to use the idea of flow turning. The aircraft wing generates lift by deflecting incoming air downwards. And there's no need to use equal transit time. There's no need to think about individual molecules bouncing off the uh, airfoil. There's no need to think about Venturi's effect um, or Bernoulli's equation. You shouldn't even really bring Bernoulli's equation in. Um, that, that the, the equation's fine. I have nothing against Bernoulli's equation. We use it a lot. but it, uh, it gets tangled up and misused in the fallacies. Um, and actually, if you go to science museums um, and you see these, these, a lot of people like doing kind of these demos of, uh, they think they're doing demos of Bernoulli's equation. Um, uh, you see there's things like where you have a ping pong ball and a jet of air and it's staying in place. Or the sheet of paper, like I mentioned before, where you blow on the sheet of paper and you watch it rise up. Um, Neither of those is a good demonstration of Bernoulli's equation, in fact. The ping pong ball and the jet of air, people say, oh, OK, the ping pong ball stays there because that jet of air is low pressure. No, that jet of air has pretty much the same pressure as the outside air, because you've taken air, compressed it to high pressure, 
and then blown at it, blown it out of the, you know, the hose, it has higher stagnation pressure, same static pressure. And actually, it's another flow turning argument, or the Kawanda effect, jet staying adhered to the surface of the ping pong ball that causes um, the ping pong ball to stay in the middle, um, and that's conservation of momentum more than Bernoulli's equation. So, in fact, I would say don't go into Bernoulli's equation um, at all. It's confusing. It, uh, it, you know, it's, it's hard to demonstrate, and it has really no place in lift generation. And if you want to get into all the details, then you have to start talking about inviscid theory, and there's, I think you start losing a lot of the intuition beyond this point. And, I mean, there's some intuition if you have a background in engineering that you can kind of appreciate, but really the first part is the most important, the flow turning part. And I would also say here, there's, um, you know, this does not explain how supersonic aircraft generate lift. Um, this has all been subsonic theory. Supersonic aircraft, much easier to analyze, actually. Um, there's much simpler solution techniques. Uh, and we'll do that in last week of aerodynamics for those of you guys who are taking it. So um, that's pretty much it. Um, I'll take questions at this point. So the Cadre satellite is a precursor satellite to a future mission called Armada. We're going to have a large constellation of satellites that go up to low Earth orbit and study the atmosphere.